UFC on ABC5, Emmett versus Tapuria just took place and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main event, giving my reaction and breakdown to every single fight on the card and my overall event recap as well. Let's start straight away with the early prelim opener of Cedric Dumas versus Cody Brandage. Now, I'm not joking you when I say this. This was one of the worst fights I've ever seen in my entire life. I missed this fight on my fight companion because I wasn't live yet. I was setting up my live stream and watching this in the corner of my eye. This was one of the worst fights I've ever seen in my entire life. I have no idea how someone gave a round to Brandage, but one of the judges managed to do so. Um, but this was terrible. And it's not even Cedric Dumas's fault. He stuffed some takedowns, ended up on top of takedowns, um, got out of guillotines in the third round that Brandage was going for, and it, he even went for one in the first round as well, I believe, that Dumas ended up on top with. It was just an absolutely middleweight performance. That's the only way I can describe this fight. Dumas won by not getting taken down and by ending up on top on the failed takedowns of Brandage. And Brandage, a wrestler, after shooting a failed takedown, just stayed there on bottom position until the end of the round. And even when Dumas was on top of him, instead of trying to get back up, he just stayed on bottom position until the end of the round. I've never seen a fighter before. Cody Brandage, this is. Well done, Dumas. You kept your career. Good for you. Maybe you can make improvements and get better and actually be good. But for Brundage, I've never seen a fighter before with a performance look out to Dana White and basically say, cut me from this promotion. I don't want to be here. Crazy. He had the chance to win. It was a great style matchup for him. But he literally quit on that fight. As soon as it wasn't easy, he absolutely quit. Get him out. LFA needs some... F I can't believe it. See you in LFA. We move on to another fight, which is... Jack Jenkins versus Jamal Emmers. I disagreed with this decision, but I'm going to have to watch it back because the stats maybe make it seem like this isn't a bad decision. Um, I thought that Jamal Emmers got the win. I thought round one was very close because both guys were landing decent shots. Emmers, I thought, landed a few more, but Jack Jenkins was landing really good body kicks in round one. So I thought maybe that round is a toss-up round. Maybe it goes to Jack Jenkins. Round two and three... I gave to Jamal Emmers pretty clearly. I thought round three was very, very clear. Very, very clear. And I think it's very weird to see 30-27 to Jamal Emmers on one side and 2-29-28 to Jack Jenkins on the other. Very, very strange. Um, I'm going to have to re-watch this fight again, by the way, but I just feel like Jamal Emmers was landing good punches on the outside. Um, he ended round two on top as well. Even though he got his back taken, he reversed position and ended that round on top, if I remember correctly. So I feel like he won that fight. And in round three, he utilized a bit more grappling as well. He had great reversals. He hit a really good sweep on Jack Jenkins, which reversed position to where he was on top. It was a very good per uh, performance from Jamal Emmers. And I thought he did enough to win. Jack Jenkins looked good. He was chewing up the leg of Jamal Emmers, going to the body with the kicks. But I thought Jamal Emmers was doing good as well, kicking at Jack Jenkins' legs, uh, landing good punches on the chin, teeping the body, jabbing to the body, giving right hands to the body at range as well. I just thought that ja Jamal Emmers did enough to win. I'm going to check on UFC Instagram to see how people reacted to that fight because maybe I'm off. But I did think that Jamal Emmers had done enough to win that fight. I wonder what the UFC posted about it on uh, on Instagram. I'll just check it right now. Oh, they posted nothing about it whatsoever. Oh, well, that's good then. Um, I guess no one can complain if they don't post about it. Um, so that's that. Never mind. I won't know what people think. The UFC's hiding it from us. We move on to another fight on the prelims, which was Ship Mariscal versus Trevor Peak. I'm so sad about this, but it was still such a fun fight between them. Absolute scrap. Takedowns here and there from Mariscal that, that Trevor Peak would scramble out of and get back up to his feet from. He's like the lightweight Derek Lewis. And he is the lightweight Derek Lewis. He loads up everything he throws. And eventually you're going to pay for that against someone who lasts outside the first round. Now, I thought Trevor Peak was going to catch Mariscal in the first round because he's just that type of guy. And while you're not ready for it in the middle of a fight... You can be caught by those shots by Trevor Peak, um, But Mariscal pulls it off. He's lost to a lot of guys outside the UFC on a regional scene. Took this fight on short notice as well. But on short notice, out-hustled Trevor Peak, which is something I've never understood about MMA. 
Um, but yeah, Trevor Peak gassed out in one round. And Mariscal went for three straight rounds and kept a good pace and never seemed to gas out. So really good job from Mariscal. The takedowns were everything. The little hip tosses he was going for and the throws that he was going for to get Trevor Peak to the ground. They were everything in this fight. So that was huge for him. But also the check hooks, the big shots he was landing. He almost finished Trevor Peak in the third round as well. Great fight from Mariscal. I'm unhappy for Peak, but he still put on a great show. And that's what we want Trevor Peak for. We don't need him to win. We just need him to put on a war. And he saved he saved the early prelims from being an absolute terrible, terrible set of early prelims. We move on to another fight on the card, which was Joshua Van versus Zalgas Amagulov. I went with Zalgas Amagulov. I don't think he can complain about the decision. Round two and three were clearly Joshua Van. I don't know how a judge gave it to Zalgas. But again, UFC judging is progressively getting worse. They want it to be bad so they can give close fights to the fighters that they want to win. I'm telling you, that's what they've been doing for years. And they've set us up for it. Um, but yeah, they do a really terrible job here. I don't know who gave the round to Zalgas. I don't know how you give Zalgas round three. Um, Joshua Van was landing really good shots towards the end of round three. Zalgas, I thought, won round one in a close round. I thought he might have landed some of the better shots. Uh, but round two and three were Joshua Van's round. Um, he started getting his boxing going a little bit more. Once he started pressuring forwards, he started having way more success. I was weirded out the whole time because of how weird Zalgas Zamagulov looks with his new haircut. But um, yeah, he said he got the new haircut so he wouldn't be robbed. He nearly got gifted a decision because they thought he was Paddy, I guess. Um, but yeah, that wasn't a robbery. Just another Zalgas and Magulov split decision. I think his career is genuinely over now. That's sad. But Joshua Van, prospect to look out for. Shook off the octagon jitters. Maybe now he can start making improvements and being a real contender at flyweight. Um, but he looked good. But in round two, here's the only thing. He hurt Zalgas and Zalgas was like backing up against a cage. And then he hit Zalgas in the groin with a massive punch. And I know the ref saw it. I know the ref saw it. Because Zalgas went, oh, to his groin. And the ref went to, like, go and step in and then stopped himself because he realized Van was still going. Like, you got to stop that groin shot. Like, you got to give Zalgas time to recover there. And he ended up taking a bunch more punches after that. So, unlucky Zalgas. Got groin shot a few times. Had to fight through it. A head clash happened as well that... He came out on the worst end of, so Zalgas just doesn't have good luck, and uh, Joshua Van looked good. Um, he is a bit small for flyweight, but he did look good, and I think he will make, he'll be all right. He's not bottom feeder level. I think Zalgas is good, and he beat Zalgas clearly, so good for him. We move on to another fight on the card, which was Tabitha Ritchie versus Gillian Robertson. Uh, probably one of the worst fights on the card, but the first fight on the card was so bad, so probably one of the worst fights that I watched live on the card with the chat and with the live stream going. Um, this was just a terrible performance by Gillian Robertson. She made it close. She arguably could have got round two, I think. It could have been 1-1 one, one going into the third. Tabitha for Ritchie did good in round one. Uh, Robertson did good in round two. Close round two, though. Richie was still landing decent shots. Round three, Richie did a little bit more. Got some takedowns as well, did Tabitha for Richie, where she would end up in top uh, position and then just stand back up. So that looked good to the judges as well to get those takedowns mixed in. And um, it was basically just Gillian Robertson, after a decade of MMA training, not understanding how to throw punches, uh, which is a really remarkable thing to find out. Now in her career, when she's about to fight a top 15 ranked opponent. Really good to find out that a, po that a fighter can't throw punches when they're about to be ranked. Really good to find that out then. Either way, we've seen her bad on the feet before. Shown no improvements there. Um, but yeah, she just sh didn't shoot takedowns. She needed to get top position. Um, she did at one point and ended up sort of bailing on it because Richie went for her leg. But she needed to try and get top position more in this fight than she did. But she barely shot takedowns and Richie shot more than her. She has a size advantage over Richie. I have no idea why that was her game plan. But there we go. MMA fighters are tards. We move on. Up the card, Mateus Rebecca versus Loic Rajabov. Uh, this fight I'm going to be happy while describing because I got my pick right. That seems to be how these event recaps are working recently, where I just sort of trash the fights where I was wrong and big up the fights where I was right. But no, seriously, this was one of the first exciting fights on the card. This was a good one. 
This was a very good one. The first finish on the card as well, I believe, for uh, Mateus Rebecca. Looked good. Looks really good. Chopped at the legs of Loic Radjabov. You could see early on the legs of Radjabov were feeling it. I don't know what it is about these Polish shin bones, but they seem to really cause damage to opponents' legs. And he was landing a bunch of those leg kicks early on, and they were causing a big damaging welt on the leg of Loic Radjabov. He started walking funny as well. Didn't really like it in round one. Rebecca was also landing the better punches. And then in round, in round one as well, he got a takedown. And ended up on top, which was very, very smart for him to try and wear out that first round because both of them were being very, very heavy throwing punches in the first round. Very, very aggressive. And Rebecca was really swinging for the bleachers. And he landed a bunch of good shots on Loic as well. But in round two, that leg started giving way. That leg started giving way real bad. Loic couldn't really stand on it whatsoever anymore. Rebecca was chewing him up. The one problem I had with Rebecca's game plan here, which showed bad fight IQ in my opinion, was the fact that he had Radjabov's leg destroyed, but he was allowing Radjabov to stand up against the cage and throw back. If he would have walked to the center and said, Radjabov, come to the center now, if Radjabov doesn't, he loses for timidity. He's not the one avoiding... Rebecca's not the one avoiding him. He'd be then avoiding Rebecca and avoiding an engagement in a fight. So if Rebecca kept him in the center... Radjabov couldn't have leaned up against a cage and afforded to stay still. You know what I'm saying? Whereas he can when he's up against the ropes or the cage. It's kind of the ropes, the equivalent, I guess. Then Rebecca, after a few more good leg kicks, landed a massive right hand that dropped uh, Loic Radjabov. But I will say it was a bit of a weird stoppage. My opinion, a little bit of a weird stoppage that they went for that. Um, he just got dropped. He might have tried to come back up on a takedown. Yes, he would have got finished anyway. But it's weird to immediately stop it after he gets dropped, even if he's still fully conscious, I think. But either way, great performance by Mateus Rebecca, who also broke his toe in that fight as well. So good for him for trooping on and keeping on and, and getting the win. Um, but very good from Rebecca. He's a little monster of a guy in that division. Got big power, very, very good at range. He's like a new Dober to look out for, kind of, right? We move on to another fighter on the card, another fight on the card, which was... Randy Brown versus Wellington Terman. I actually disagreed with this decision, you know. Just going to say it how it is. It was a very close fight. I remember I will have to watch it again, maybe. I kind of thought that maybe Terman could have got that win over Randy Brown. It was a very close fight. But I don't know if Randy Brown ultimately secured that. And the problem is nowadays, when there's a decision on a card that's controversial, the UFC doesn't post about it. So we never hear about it, basically, if there isn't a finish, which is really strange that they don't do that anymore. But I get it. They don't want to cause a bit of controversy. So I completely understand. Um, but yeah, either way, I thought Randy Brown lost. I thought his legs were getting chewed up in round one by Wellington Terman, who, by the way, he's become Pereira. Didn't even use his grappling in this fight. Got no takedowns. I swear he's become Pereira. His style is identical to Pereira now. The way of leg kicking is identical as well. The way he threw the right straight to the body at range was exactly how Pereira throws it. The little left hook tuck over that he does, the tucked up left hook, exactly like Pereira does it. I swear, Pereira has literally gone, you're striking like an absolute BJJ soy boy, okay? You need to strike like a kickboxing Chad. And he taught him how to strike non-soy. Um, I picked Randy Brown, but I thought Wellington did damage with the leg kicks in round one, which was the damaging strikes, which I think need to be considered a bit more when you see someone limping around and feeling the effects of a leg kick. And in round three, I thought he was busier in the clinch against a cage. And they were pretty even at range. And he landed good leg kicks. So I thought Wellington Terman should have won that, but they gave it to Randy Brown. Good for him. Very close. Not going to say brutal robbery, but... I thought it was Wellington Terman's fight, objectively speaking, based on damage. But either way, Randy Brown wins. I'm still proud of Wellington Terman for actually looking pretty improved. He moved down to welterweight and he took it seriously because any other middleweight is getting smoked in that division. So he took it seriously and he upped his game for that fight, which was almost impressively effective for him, but he didn't get the win. We move on to another fight. Neil Magny versus Philip Rowe. This one was just another sad one to watch of two guys clinching up against a cage non-stop in the fight and not much going on on the feet at range. 
Neither guy can be angry about whoever won this fight. I genuinely think it could go either way. I gave it to Neil Magny, though, because the one difference that I noticed, and the total strikes will represent this, although it was 34-29 on significant strikes to Philip Rowe, it was 109-51 to in total strikes. And those total strikes were done in the clinch up against the cage, where they spent the majority of the fight. So whenever they were clinching, it was... Magny's winning. It wasn't nothing is happening. Magny was doing little punches, little elbows on the inside, knees to the thigh, knees to the body, stuff like that. Keep him busy with punches and uh, knees in the clinch. And uh, that's what won him the fight. I gave him rounds two and three. Philip Rowe can arguably win round one on damage. Um, but I thought Magny can win that fight 2-1 based on the last two rounds. Very bad performance from both of them. They're both terrible, and they let down the welterweight division that that was nearly a ranked level fight. That's an embarrassment. Terrible performance from both, but Magny wins, so I guess it's him versus JDM next. What prospect's gonna kill him next, guys? Let's line them up. We move on. Brendan Allen versus Bruno Silva. Brendan Allen, man, slowly doing his thing, you know. Slowly doing his thing in that middleweight division. I know he's a middleweight, so he's trash anyway. But he's slowly doing his thing. You have to give him credit for that. He's looking good. He's looking powerful. He keeps very good striking defense now. He's improved upon that since losing to Strickland and losing to Chris Curtis as well. Back-to-back, -back, I believe it was, or within a similar time frame. No, he didn't lose back-to-back. -back. He beat. He lost to Strickland, 1-2, then lost to Curtis. But he's looked good since then. Beat Alvi, obviously. It's Sam Alvi. Jacob Malkoon, very close fight, but he out damaged him just barely. Then he beat Jocko, looked great, finished him in the first round, finished Andre Maniz by submission, which is crazy, and then beat Bruno Silva by knocking him down and then subbing him. Very impressive performance by Brendan Allen. He's a natural finisher, he's got a good chin, he's got decent striking defense. He doesn't move his head much, but he keeps his guard up. And I was worried at one point in this fight because I was like, damn, he's not shooting takedowns. But at least he tried a few. He tried two takedowns, and I think that was enough to make Bruno Silva worry because after he shot those takedowns, he then sort of faked level changed and body kicked Bruno Silva twice. Hard. He landed a bunch of good body kicks. You could see Silva was feeling them. Silva landed a few good shots in some moments, but Brendan Allen did a very good job of staying patient, covering up, and waiting for his time to throw back. And he started landing shots back on Bruno Silva. And that's what won him the fight. He got caught by an uppercut, tucked up in his guard, and landed a nasty hook right back on Bruno Silva that dropped him badly. And then he swarmed all over him and went for the finish and got the rear naked choke. Very good from Brendan Allen. Used the most of his mic time afterwards. I say just rebook him versus Hermanson for September in France. That's what I say you do. We move on to another fight up the card, which was a fight between... Let me go all the way back. It was David Onama versus Gabriel Santos. Good job by David Onama. Gabriel Santos was winning the fight, okay? But in round two, Onama reversed position and was landing some good ground and pound and eventually got a KO in the second round. So the fight went like this. Round one, Onama landing good shots, but Santos rocking Onama a little bit, wobbling him a little bit, getting a reaction off of the shots that he was landing. Onama wobbling a bit and covering up against the cage and Santos going for a finish and looking to jump for an armbar, which might have been a bit too much. Maybe he should have just gone for the rear naked choke. But he went for the armbar. He went for the triangle as well. He was trying to lash up a bunch of different subs, um, but he just gave up too much time on bottom position, which was the problem. But he felt so comfortable there. One round one. Round two. Lands some good shots again. Hurts Onama. At one moment, Onama shoots in a bad takedown. Santos gets the back from it as well, which is very good for him. Gets the body triangle. But because Onama's got such thin hips, he can get out of body triangles. I swear, it's the thin hip um, privilege that they have. They can get out of these body triangles, even though the guy's got his legs locked up. You know what I mean? He can, they can just spin out of it and end up on top. Um, and that's what he did. He ended up on top, landed some good shots. And on the feet, he landed a nasty shovel uppercut and knocked out Gabriel Santos. Very good comeback win after a rough first round. Still showed some problems. The main problem with this fight, and this post is getting a ton of likes on social media right now, but the comments, it's just so pathetic to me, man. It really is. Why copy him? Why are you copying Adesanya, dude? And he ruined it as well. 
He genuinely ruined the bow and arrow celebration. He did it so badly. It looked so weird the way he did it. He was just doing it weirdly with no real effort. There was no reason for him to do it. He didn't even fire the last arrow, which was so weird. You know what I mean? He just, he ruined a great KO by a cringe, honestly cringe copycat celebration. But he's African. So maybe Adesanya will like post about him because he done it. Maybe. He is getting some interaction on social media for the win, which is good. But I think people are going to find it cringe. You know what I mean? Just stole the celebration. Izzy's celebration was cool because it had meaning. Pereira started that as the bow and arrow thing. That was Pereira's thing. And he beat Izzy three times. So Izzy shot three arrows at him and then finished him off with a fourth, which was the one that he KO'd him with, which was the fight that he won, the final fight, the one out of the four that Israel Adesanya won against him. It had significance. This is, you, you, this is just you shooting a bow at some guy that you landed a punch on after getting smoked by him. You know what I mean? Like, get a grip of yourself, you little cringy little fucking freak. Little midget OSP looking thing. We move on to another fight, which was between Austin Lane and Justin Tuffer. I say fight. There wasn't much of a fight. And the reason was, Tuffer got eye poked so badly. I saw it immediately. It was a weird angle. But I saw the fingers in the eyes of Onama, for, for, of um, Justin Tafa from the angle. And it was, I saw it went straight in the eye. Maybe even two fingers in the eye. But I saw it and I went, that's a bad eye poke. I don't know about this one, guys. And he didn't continue. He couldn't continue. Couldn't open his eye. Couldn't see out of the eye. And if you can't see out the eye, they ain't going to let you fight. Simple as that. So the fight got called off. I say rebook it for Australia. I will say this, Austin Lane was looking pretty athletic on the feet, and he landed a bunch of good leg kicks, uh, body kicks. He landed two really solid body kicks to start off the fight, so he actually looked promising. Um, I did think Tafa was going to eventually win by KO, but I'd like to see it run back, and I want to see it in September. I think that would be a good run back time in Australia for Justin Tafa. and yeah, that was terrible. Terrible eye poke. We move on. Macy Barber versus Amanda Ribas. Well done, Macy Barber, you know. Well done. She actually finally got an impressive win. Actually finally got an impressive impressive win. Got the TKO in round two. I think the stoppage was weird, but not bad. It like could have been stopped before it was. But for some reason, Keith Peterson is on a mission to rally up terrible stoppages recently. Because she was landing shots on Ribas. They could have stopped the fight. And Peterson waited until Ribas locked up like a body lock from on bottom to try and get back up from the position. He waited until that moment. Like, he waited until Ribas tried to defend herself to finally step in, which was so stupid of him. Um, but either way, Macy Barber won the fight by TKO. She lost to Miranda Maverick, but got given the win. Um, lost to Roxanne Modafferi because of an injury. I get it. Whatever. Arguably lost to Andrea Lee, but smokes Ribas. Women's MMA makes sense. Great KO by Macy Barber, though. Right on the chin. Head kick to a left hook or a right hook. Then followed it up with some big shots that put down Ribas. Very, very good from Macy Barber. And, yeah, she's promising. So we'll see what she can do now. Definitely improved her striking game and her grappling game. Um, Ribas did something really silly. She was easily winning the first round. And then for some bizarre, silly, only a Tard would do this type reason... Um, she decided to dive for a leg while defending a takedown, put herself on bottom, and not let go of that leg, even though she received about 15 ground and pound strikes, mashing up her face. Really smart from her. I have a real theory that 90% of MMA fighters have Down syndrome. We move on up the card. Ilya Tapuria versus Josh Emmett. Very good performance from Ilya Tapuria. I've done a whole breakdown on it on my channel, on a video I just posted. Um, very, very impressive performance. I guess I'll talk about what he did well. The range control from him was amazing. He knew where he was in danger and he knew where he wasn't. And when he was in danger, his guard was glued to his chin. And I mean that, glued to his chin. His guard did not leave his chin when he was in the pocket. There were moments where it did, but when Emmett was loading up, that guard came right back beside his chin and defended himself. Paddy Pimlet needs to learn from that massively. Amazing performance from Ilya Tapuria. And a star is potentially born because an hour ago, Sergio Ramos is posting love hearts all over the comments 
of his finish. And Sergio Ramos is a huge, huge name with nearly 60 million followers on social media. He is a huge name in football, especially in the Spanish-speaking community. And this is huge for Ilya Tapuria to get this sort of endorsement from Sergio Ramos. Because Ilya's now jumped from, I believe it was 750,000 to 836,000 followers. Which is crazy. He's jumped nearly 100,000 off that win. He is set to be a superstar. He's the Spanish-speaking superstar that we've needed in these lower divisions. Moreno was one of them, but now we have Ilya in featherweight. We have Rodriguez, but he hasn't really got that star power that it seems like Ilya has. Because Ilya seems to talk well. He speaks good English. He talks trash. He backs himself. You know, he's got the fashion. He's got the look. I feel like Ilya really could be a star. And I think he earned a title shot. I think he has earned a title shot in that division, and um, I think it's going to be good for him. I think it will be a good challenge for Volk if Volk does beat Rodriguez. I think if Rodriguez beats Volk, they're going to do a rematch anyway, so we'll see what happens there. Um, but very, very good performance from Ilya Tapuria. Very patient. He would wait for Emmett to go and then finish the exchange with shots of his own that were way better than Emmett's, and he just had it in full control. Great range control, great patience, good timing, good cardio, very mature performance, and we needed to see that before I can even think he beats Volk. You know, before I can even think he beats the top five, we needed, to see, we needed to see him separate himself from Emmett. Because so far, the people that made it close with Emmett have proved that they can't be top five level. You know, Ige makes it close with Emmett, gets dominated by TKZ. Kata makes it close with Emmett, got, get, gets dominated by Holloway. We need to see you make it clear against Emmett. And then we can consider you a top contender. And that's what Ilya Tapuria is. He's a top five guy. Should be ranked number three above Allen and, and Ortega. Who have they really beat? What have they really done? Especially Ortega, that is. I'm not trying to slash Allen. He has earned his spot. But I think Tapuria's got a better win. And I think Ortega has done nothing. So Ilya deserves to be at number three. We move on to nothing else. I got the main event right. I got other picks on the card wrong. I'm going to be real with you guys. I've genuinely been... Last year and the year before... The, last year when I was the top ever fight predictor, I used to do research for main events and big fights on cards that I knew people cared about, that I wanted to be right on. But for the rest of the card, I genuinely, I genuinely just went, eh, I feel like him, 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 and her. I genuinely did that. I just looked at him, thought about it. 10 seconds of thinking, I got that guy. I've genuinely been watching tape on these prelim fighters. I've been doing research, and I'm more wrong by far on the prelims. I don't get it. MMA is just... I'm not going to do research anymore. It's punishing me. I'm just going to go off my hunches. And my hunches are normally right anyway. I feel like whenever I overthink something, I always switch picks. I had Barber beating Ribas. But then I overthink it. But Jazuda Vicious just beat Miranda Maverick and Mar Miranda Maverick should have won. I literally said when this fight was first announced, I think Barber's too scrappy and she'll KO Ribas. Why didn't I just pick that? I overthink it. I do the research. I find the logic that makes me pick Ribas. I should have gone against the logic and gone with Hunch. See you later. Goodbye.